What's up everybody, I'm Hoops and Hip Hop. So, a couple of weeks ago I decided to take on the crazy task of identifying 151 facts about every Kanto Pokemon. Originally I thought I was in way over my head and I was really kind of worried about how well you guys would receive this sort of video given how much time it took, but you guys actually really liked both parts of that video, so much so that I've decided to go ahead and make this a sort of series and do it for every single other region, and today we are here to talk about the Johto region. Now, while the Johto region doesn't have quite as many Pokemon as Kanto does, there are still a hundred Pokemon to cover here, and I am going to be covering one distinct fact that you may or may not know, because I really try and find cool facts about each and every single one of them. However, just like the Kanto video, given that there are a hundred Pokemon to cover here, and I do like to give every Pokemon the spotlight it deserves, I am going to be splitting this up into two parts. So in this video, we'll be covering the first 50 Johto Pokemon, and a week from today, we'll be covering the second 50 Johto Pokemon. With all that being said though, there's still a ton to talk about and a ton of interesting facts to share, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Okay, so really quick before we get into the Johto Pokemon, I've got to give you guys a quick fact about Pinsir, because in the last video about Kanto, I made a big oof and somehow forgot Pinsir, and obviously I need to give you a fact about every Kanto Pokemon, so I'm going to go ahead and do that really quick. So Pinsir is often seen as a counterpart to the Johto Pokemon Heracross, which is a bit unusual considering the whole counterpart thing usually happens within the same generation, with Pokemon like Vulpix and Growlithe, for instance. However, the connection between these two Pokemon goes even deeper when you consider that the gold and silver beta demo that leaked earlier this year contained a Pokemon that looks very similar to Pinsir and is most likely either A, an evolution to Pinsir that was scrapped and replaced with Heracross, or it is a pre-beta like beta design for Heracross itself, which really shows how closely tied together these Pokemon are, and hey, it kind of relates to Johto, so it works out. Okay, now we can really get into the Johto Pokemon with Chikorita. In early artwork for Chikorita, as well as in its gold and silver sprites, Chikorita's body was yellow. However, in subsequent artwork, as well as the Pokemon Crystal sprites, this was later changed to the light green color that we know today. With its evolution Bayleaf, the leaves that surround Bayleaf's neck have often been described as having a spicy aroma. However, this is a bit inconsistent because actual bay leaves, which Bayleaf itself is based on, are known to have a bitter taste. Next up is of course Meganium, and according to Meganium's various Pokedex entries, its breath of all things actually has the ability to revive flowers and other dead plants, so it basically has the best smelling breath of all time. And now we have the privilege to talk about the boy, Cyndaquil. Originally, Cyndaquil, as a matter of fact, was not going to be the starter in Generation 2, because as we know with the aforementioned Gold and Silver Beta demo that was recently leaked, the original starter for Generation 2 was a little fire bear known as Honaguma. However, at some time after the development and release of the Gold and Silver Beta demo, the mighty Lord Helix came to Ken Sugimori in a vision and showed him the blessing that is Cyndaquil, causing Ken Sugimori to swap out Honaguma for Cyndaquil that we know and love today, and yes, that is exactly how it happened, uh, my dad works at Game Freak. When Cyndaquil evolves into Quilava, it becomes known as the Volcano Pokemon. Quilava actually shares this category with its evolution Typhlosion, as well as Entei, and coincidentally, all three of these Pokemon are capable of learning the move Eruption. So part of Typhlosion's name actually comes from the word Typhoon, which is a bit ironic considering that Typhoons are tropical storms that have to do with water and have nothing to do with fire. However, this is actually explained pretty well in Typhlosion's dex entries, where it explains that Typhlosion is able to hide behind a shimmery, fiery haze that it is able to create using its intense flames. Moving on to the water starter of the Johto region, Totodile is actually the tallest and the heaviest unevolved water starter Pokemon. With its evolution Croconaw, you might have already noticed that it has a caveman-like pattern on its body. However, this is a bit unusual considering that neither Totodile or its evolution Feraligator have anything to do with cavemen themselves in their own designs. So Feraligator evolves from Croconaw at level 30, which is the earliest that any starter Pokemon will be fully evolved. However, Totodile evolves into Croconaw at level 18, which is ironically the latest that any starter Pokemon will ever evolve into its second form. Speaking of ironic facts, Sentrid actually gets part of its name from the word Sentry, which is basically like a lookout in military terms. However, even though it itself is a lookout, it actually has a target-like circle on its chest. 
When it comes to its evolution, Furret, in addition to the fact that Furret is almost six feet in length, which is already completely terrifying as it is, according to the Pokedex, Furret is quote-unquote quick at hunting Rattata, which basically confirms it as a carnivore, which means none of us are safe from the wrath that is Furret. Coming up next is Hoot Hoot, and according to a Nintendo Power interview, Ken Sugimori stated that Hoot Hoot is actually his favorite Pokemon because as a child he had a bird that only ever stood on one leg. However, as interesting as this is, it's also a bit contradictory because as we talked about in the last episode about Kanto, Gengar is actually Ken Sugimori's favorite Pokemon according to a number of different sources. So while it's unclear which Pokemon is truly Ken Sugimori's favorite, this story is still interesting nonetheless. With Noctowl, Noctowl was actually the very first shiny Pokemon to ever appear in the Pokemon anime. Ladyba is known as the 5 star Pokemon, which is signified by the number of dots on its back. However, in the Gold and Silver beta demo, which once again was recently leaked, it actually had 7 stars on its back instead of 5. Its evolution, Lady Anne, is also known as the 5 star Pokemon for this same reason. However, Lady Anne actually has to do with actual stars a bit more than you might think, because according to its various dex entries, it actually has a relationship with the stars, and the spots on its back will grow larger or smaller depending on the number of stars in the night sky. With Ladybug's counterpart Spinarak, it's actually based on the Happy Face Spider, which is a spider that resides in Hawaii, which explains perfectly why you are able to find Spinarak in the wild in the Alola region. According to Ariados' gold dex entry, it spins string not only from its rear, but also from its mouth. It's hard to tell which end is which. Ew. Moving on, Crobat's color scheme is actually the reverse of its pre-evolution Golbat, and this holds up for their shiny forms as well. One of my favorite Johto Pokemon is Chinchou, and Chinchou actually gets its name from the Japanese word for lantern, which is Cho Chin, basically just flip-flopping the order of the syllables in the word, which is pretty cool. With its evolution lantern, according to its dex entries, the light it emits is so bright that it can illuminate the sea's surface from a depth of over three miles. Now, that's insanely ridiculous, but I also wonder how lantern doesn't go blind with that light right in its face. Coming up next is Pichu, and Pichu actually used to be Junichi Masuda's favorite Pokemon. However, his new favorite is currently Victini. With Cleffa, it gets its name not only from Clefairy, which is its evolution, but also the word Clef, which is obviously a musical term. This actually makes a lot of sense because once it evolves into Clefairy, one of its signature moves, at least in gold and silver anyway, is Metronome, which of course is a musical device used to keep time. Speaking of baby Pokemon, its counterpart Igglybuff actually has the lowest defense, special defense, and speed of all fairy-type Pokemon. Moving on to the iconic Pokemon Togepi, despite Togepi being basically the mascot for the breeding mechanic, as well as baby Pokemon in general, Togepi is the only baby Pokemon that was revealed before its evolution, given the fact in all other cases of baby Pokemon, they are actually introduced as pre-evolutions to their already existing evolution. Being a fairy flying type, no other Pokemon actually have the same type combination as Togetic and its evolution Togekiss. Natu shares its species name with Pidgey and Spearow all being known as the Tiny Bird Pokemon. However, Natu actually had its species changed because in Generation 2, it was known as the Little Bird Pokemon. According to its Silver, Fire Red, and Soul Silver Dex entries, Zatu is actually involved in South American myths, which obviously connects it directly to the real world. When it comes to Mareep, it's actually possible that Mareep was originally going to be a very different sort of Pokemon, because according to an interview with Junichi Masuda and Ken Sugimori, there was a Pokemon that was likely intended for Generation 2 that was going to be based on the very first cloned sheep. However, it was scrapped when it was deemed too controversial for Pokemon. So due to the fact that this Pokemon was going to be introduced in Generation 2, and we also have Mareep who was introduced in Generation 2, and they're both sheep Pokemon, it very possibly could mean that Mareep is just a redesign of this original idea for a clone sheep Pokemon. Its evolution Flaffy actually has a very clever name because it comes from the word Fluffy with the word Ba as in the sound a sheep makes inserted right into it. It also could get that double A from double A batteries since it's an electric type. During the development of Gold and Silver, it was actually stated that Ampharos was originally going to be an electric dragon type, which is super interesting considering the fact that it did become an electric dragon type with its mega evolution in Generation 6, which is likely a callback to this original typing. 
In Blossom's original gold and silver artwork, its body was actually blue, much like that of its pre-evolutions. However, this was obviously changed to the green, and it was likely changed due to the fact that Blossom is partially based on a hula dancer, and this dark coloration to its body could potentially be seen as controversial. Speaking of Pokemon with different colored designs, Meryl was actually originally pink in its earlier beta form. Coming up next, its evolution Azumarill is actually the only member of its evolutionary family who was not revealed prior to the generation that it debuted in. Sudowoodo actually has the same height as a previous Johto Pokemon Lantern at 3 foot 11. Ironically, its pre-evolution Bonsai also has the same height as Lantern's pre-evolution Chinchou, standing at 1 foot 8 inches tall. Coming up next is Politoed, and the general idea for Politoed can actually be seen as far back as before Generation 1 was even a thing, because we can see an early pre-Generation 1 sprite for Poliwrath, where it's wearing a crown, which is likely the King's Rock that Poliwhirl has to hold in order to evolve into Politoed once it's traded, likely signifying that they took this original idea for Poliwrath and reworked it into Politoed. With Hoppip, Hoppip's shiny color is green, which is the regular color of its evolution, Skiploom. Likewise, Skiploom's shiny color is a red-pink sort of color, which is the regular color of its pre-evolution, Hoppip. In the random Pokedex entry category, Skiploom's Ruby Dex entry says that its flower blossoms when the temperature rises above 64 degrees Fahrenheit. How much the flower opens depends on the temperature. For that reason, this Pokemon is sometimes used as a thermometer. Moving on to Jumpluff, Jumpluff only weighs 6.6 .6 pounds, which is also 3 kilograms, and this is actually the lightest of any Pokemon that has undergone two evolutions. In the creepy Pokedex entry category, according to Apom's Ultra Moon Dex entry, it searches for prey from the tops of trees. When it spots its favorite food, Bounce Sweet, Apom gets excited and pounces. Now this brings up some creepy information, but it also brings up a really big question. On the one hand, this could confirm Apom as a carnivore, but on the other hand, it could confirm Bounce Wheat as a fruit, which just brings up a whole nother set of questions about Pokemon Anatomy. In Generation 2, Sunkern's official artwork actually resembled its shiny form as opposed to its regular form, because while its shiny was a gold color, its original regular form was more of a green color, however, this was rectified starting in Generation 3. When it comes to its evolution Sunflora, oddly enough, Sunflora is Meowth's most used disguise in the anime, having used Sunflora as a disguise a total of seven times. Coming in with another weird fact, Yanma actually weighs the exact same as the Generation 4 male protagonist Lucas. It actually also shares this characteristic with Sudowoodo, Skunk Tank, Togekiss, and Fero as well. Moving on to Wooper, Wooper's English name actually has a very interesting backstory. It comes from the name Wooper Looper, which was a marketing term created in Japan that basically started a fad of raising pet salamanders. And Wooper Loopers are actually the name for the axolotl, which is the species of salamander that Wooper is based on. Its evolution Quagsire is also known as Moorlord in German, coming from the words Moor, which is a type of wetland, and Lord, which basically confirms what I personally already knew, and that's the fact that uh, Quagsire is a god. Moving on to Espeon, as well as Umbreon for that matter, these Pokemon are completely unobtainable in Fire Red and Leaf Green except through trade, because in order to evolve these Pokemon, you have to train up Eevee either in the day for Espeon or in the night for Umbreon, which is impossible to do in Fire Red and Leaf Green since the games do not have a time system. Speaking of Umbreon though, Umbreon was actually originally going to be a poison type, as was revealed in the Gold and Silver Beta demo. The remnants of this can actually be seen in the final games though, because according to its Gold Dex entry, it actually has poisonous sweat that it is able to emit from its pores. With Murkrow, despite obviously being a Generation 2 Pokemon, it was ever only obtainable in the Kanto section of Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. According to Slowking's Crystal Dex entry, every time it yawns, Shelder injects more poison into it. The poison makes it more intelligent. Now, this Dex entry is just all kinds of weird, because not only is it saying that poison is what is making Slowking smarter, which doesn't really make any sense, but it's also saying that Shelder is injecting the poison, and Shelder isn't a poison type. So, uh, yeah, unclear. According to Mistrevis's Ruby and Sapphire Dex entries, it frightens people with a creepy sobbing cry. The Pokemon apparently uses its red spheres to absorb the fearful feelings of foes and turns them into nutrition. 
Now, we have had several weird and creepy Pokedex entries already in this video, but uh, I think this one definitely takes the cake. And last but not least for this video, we have Unknown. Now, a curious thing about Unknown is that if you don't have its Pokedex data in your game, when you link your game with Pokemon Stadium 2, and then you go to Professor Oak's lab, Unknown's Pokedex number will be listed as 252 instead of 201. Now, this could obviously be a glitch, but given that Unknown is already such a mysterious Pokemon and has so much to do with legendary Pokemon, it's interesting to think about whether this had any truthful speculations about Unknown's original intent. Whew. And there we have it everybody, the first half of the Johto Pokedex is now covered. I am really having a lot of fun covering these facts for you guys, and I really hope you enjoyed this video as much as you enjoyed the previous two in this series. If you did, be sure to give the video a like because it really helps out, and let me know down in the comments below which of these facts was your favorite, and what you are looking forward to as we continue this series, or if there's another fact I didn't mention that you would really like to share. Additionally, if you're new to the channel as well, be sure to subscribe for more Pokemon content every Tuesday, Thursday, and and Saturday. With all that being said though, I will be back on Thursday for another video, so be sure to hit that notification bell so you can be notified as soon as it goes live, and until then, as always, I will smell you guys later.